Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth presentation on the power of population data science webinar series. It's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Butler and Wayne Jones, who will be pre presenting on multi-jurisdictional epidemiological research in Canada, challenges and opportunities. By way of introduction, Amanda Butler is a PhD student and CIHR doctoral award recipient in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. Before pursuing her PhD, Ms. Butler spent nearly four years as a research program manager at the Center for Applied Research in Mental, research in mental Health and Addiction. In this role, Ms. Butler managed and contributed to several provincial and national projects using administrative data, including Informing the Future Mental Health Indicators for Canada, sponsored by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Ms. Butler's current research focuses on mental health issues and substance use disorders among justice-involved populations in BC. Wayne Jones is a research associate at the Centre for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addiction, he joined the Mental Health Evaluation and Community Consultation Unit in October 1999 and moving to Karma uh, in 2006. Prior to this, he spent over six years with Hospital Planning and Development Department at the Greater Vancouver Regional Hospital District. He has extensive experience in the use of MSP, DAD and Pharmanet data. Within each of these positions, Mr. Jones has made use of local and provincial-wide administrative data to examine the prevalence and distribution of mental illness and substance use disorders within BC, the development and implementation of performance and quality indicators for BC and Canada-wide mental health systems, and the measurement of treated prevalence through the use of administrative data. So welcome once again, Amanda and Wayne, and Amanda, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Anne. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for being here. And thank you, Anne, for the kind introduction and for the uh, invitation to participate in the webinar series. Um, so I'm sitting here in the same room um, as Wayne, and we're going to go through the presentation together. I just wanted to mention, we were invited to, um, to present in the webinar series um, based on a paper that we recently had published. And uh, we're going to talk about the paper in the presentation, but we're also going to talk more generally about um, the project, which is why here I've acknowledged the original project sponsors um, and our, our project co-authors, and we don't have any um, topics to disclose. So in terms of our outline for the presentation, um, I'm going to be doing most of most of the talking. I was the um, the, the sort of the lead and the, the manager on the project that we're going to be presenting today. And Wayne Jones, my co-presenter, was the lead analyst on the project. So he's going to be doing um, a little bit of the talking around more of the data aspects of the project. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more around the project tools and processes. So Wayne's going to do a little bit of an introduction into administrative health data sources in Canada for those of you who might be um, a bit newer to this content. And then I'm going to describe um, a project that, that we did um, and just briefly go over the tools and the processes of the project. And then I'll hand it back over to Wayne. Sorry about that noise. I should stop in a second. It's just um, the heater in, in the building that we're in. <laughs> um, and then I'll hand it back over to Wayne, who's going to just talk about a few of the results of the project, not all of them, but just to give you an example. And then it'll go back over to me to tie things up with key learnings and some recent uh, progress in the area of linked administrative data in Canada. So for now, I'm going to hand it over to Wayne. So um, just briefly, uh, just to be clear, first off, that we will be talking about uh, administrative health data in kind of a very high level general sense and focusing primarily on mental health and addictions. Uh, there's a lot of different disciplines working um, on a lot of different areas with a lot of different data sets across the country. Uh, but our particular area of expertise is mental health and addictions, and that's what we're just going to be basically focused in on now. Um, from a sort of a, um, a data perspective, from administrative data, all the data is really kind of collected internally within the different uh, provincial or territorial health systems. Um, the, they're responsible for health. Um, and basically that's where the data resides. If it's collected at a, from an administrative or provincial system, 
And this kind of breaks down into different particular areas that um, are being used. So within like Canada as a whole, and again, I just want to emphasize this is kind of um, a very oversimplified situation. There's physician billing data, which, um, you know, in BC, it is if a physician bill is, provides a service, they get the bill, the medical services plan, so it's known as medical services billing data. They fill out a, a claim, it goes to the province, the province pays the claim, and the province has, maintains that information along the way. That's just true for every province across the country, and most of the territories have same similar type of system along the way. From a Canada-wide perspective, in terms of mental health data, the one group that is of interest it tends to use this data more than others right at this point in time is so the Public Health Agency of Canada. There's also hospital data. I mean, if you have been admitted to hospital for um, day surgery um, or inpatient stay, that uh, that data is um, collated by medical records, it's sent on to the Institute for Health Information or PIHI. They um, basically collect all of that data, um, summarize it all, send it back to the different provinces in kind of a clean format, and they also have the ability to look at that data and analyze that data. Within that data is um, you know, all of your diagnosis associated with your hospital stay, what procedures might have been done on you, um, and who did the procedures with the doctor, what not the length of stay. Again, so that's a different federal agency than the Public Health Agency of Canada, but again, they have a detailed data set of one picture of the health system. Another example of um, data being collected administrative data collected against um, vital statistics data. Every province is responsible for collecting all the death data, marriage data, birth data in, the, in their particular province. Again, they send that on to Stats Canada. Um, it says death data here because we're not really, from a mental health perspective, too interested in births. Uh, but um, vital statistics, again, is being collated by Statistics Canada, another agency that also supports the works with uh, public health agencies in Canada and high to some degree, but again, a separate industry. And the last one on your screen there um, is community data. Community data could be things like um, if you're treated in a public um, um, community mental health center, if you're treated in a mental health um, program, if you're treated just a community health programs um, for not mental health things. All of that data tends to reside within the organization that's collecting or providing the treatment. It may or may not be rolled up and collected by the health authority that's there. That health authority may or may not, depending on what province you're in, report to the province. And at this point in time, there is no consolidation of that data across the provinces in Canada at this point in time. So what we find is there's a variety of different uh, agencies at the national level working with different data sets. Um, they work together on a project by project basis, but there's kind of no formal data sharing agreements between them all. Um, and just as an example, like um, what's happening here is that they, you know, when things are starting to happen again in terms of data things like community data being like uh, emergency department data, it starts to be collected up by Kaihai to some degree. They're working across the country, and it takes a long time to get all of this data together. So data is fragmented and from different parts. So what's the problem of all of this thing? Um, well, it's not really a problem. It's a way that's evolved within Canada. Um, that, you know, there are different national agencies compiling provincial level data, uh, but they don't really necessarily share or always collaborate, collaborate meaningfully with each other. 
The pack itself doesn't contribute directly to Kai-Hai, for example. It's not a problem. They do provide data to Kai-Hai, and Kai-Hai can work it out along with the pack data and provide information across the country. But it has to be negotiated every time. And when you take this by 12 or 13 things, the regional infrastructures are quite complex. I mean, it takes a lot to collect this data. In BC alone, you know, there's a people collecting MSD data, there's people working with uh, hospital data, there's people working with community data, there's people working at you know, BC Center for Disease Control, working on their own types of data sets too. It just a whole lot of different data sets sitting around. There's no standardization of what's being collected. And there is no kind of overarching research sharing agreements. And just to give an example of this, kind of what things can happen here, um, I sit on two national committees, one with TAC and one with hi hi um, We often end up dealing with different sets of data issues and I'm part of it. You know, our role here as a city is to advise and undertake things. And the questions that often come up are essentially exactly the same within each of these organizations. Uh, so we end up having, you know, two agencies basically re repeating what they're doing. There's also, quite honestly, you know, I mean, data is not a um, glamorous um, position within the federal government, and there's a lot of churn in terms of staffing and that. People, smart people, there's a smart people in, in the federal government, and they move on to other projects. So you end up dealing with a lot of people. For those of us who sit around and work with this stuff for years and years, you see a lot of people going by. And the final kind of two points here is just to basically to show that it's not me whining about this stuff or me and Amanda, but basically other people have recognized it too. Uh, and there's a couple of quotes here, just basically um, saying that we got some good data here, but um, we're not making the most use of it at this point. In time. So I need that. On to Amanda again. Great, thanks, Wayne. So I think you know what what Wayne has sort of summarized. I'm just giving a very brief snapshot of um, the landscape particularly to, to mental health and um, substance use data. There are some reasons why um, in that particular area that we face some additional difficulties around um, data quality and reporting that you might not see in some other health areas. Um, so those are kind of additional challenges for us. So the way that we're going to approach talking further about this question is to use a case study, which is a project that, um, that Wayne and I led um, from 2015 to 2017 at the Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addiction with a group of collaborators um, across the country. So the project included five Canadian provinces, so us, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. Um, I just want to say that there was no magic necessarily to the five provinces that were included, uh, with the exception that a number of the, um, the collaborators um, had worked together in the past and were really keen to drive this forward and it involved a lot of, um, let's say, volunteered time um, to, to push this project forward. So that's not to say that Saskatchewan or other provinces couldn't participate in the future, but it really was um, a sort of a smaller scale project with the goal of testing the feasibility of creating mental health and performance indicators that could be compared on the provincial level. So there are some um, information, as Wayne mentioned, that sit at the national level, but in Canada, health service delivery is um, under the jurisdiction of the provinces. So it's really important that we're that we're able to get get some of this information so that we can compare what's going on across the country and learn from from each other. So that was the initial goal. I just want to say a little bit about what this project was not. Um, it wasn't uh, a, a true key performance indicator project in that the indicators weren't selected based on you know, standardized KPI criteria. They weren't necessarily chosen to be the best and the most novel, but rather they were selected on the basis of comparability so that we could test some of these ideas around how to, how to move this forward in Canada. So in terms of us, um, broadly, there were four kind of major steps, and um, all of them were pretty intensive because of some of the challenges that we've already recognized. 
Um, the first thing that we had to do really was get everybody together to decide on a set of indicators and develop very precise definitions for what those indicators would look like. So because the um, provincial administrative data can't cross provincial boundaries, all of the, the initial analysis needed to be done within each province before it could be collated. Um, as a result, we had to have very specific um, indicator definitions to make sure that all of the teams were pulling the data in the exact same way. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that involved a series of, of meetings weekly or bi-weekly for several months um, and keeping a very specific document which was updated after every meeting. So it was a fairly intensive process, but one that um, you realize later on is extremely important to get that step right. Um, once we had decided on the definitions, each provincial team needed to go about their own data access request based on the process in their own province. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, suffice to say, based on challenges that um, there are differences certainly in ethical approval processes, the ways that you, that you apply to access the data, the length of time the analysis takes, the cost, all of those uh, differ across the country. And then finally, um, the analysis needed to occur, inter occur internally within internally within each province, and then the final aggregated results were sent to Karma, where the all of the provinces were aggregated to do the provincial comparisons. And then finally, we established a working group to spend some time on the interpretation of the data and look at some of the patterns, trends, and differences across the provinces. So we ended up with um, six performance indicators. Um, these were these are indicators that you've seen elsewhere in the literature and have, have been collected um, in Canada at the national level and by some individual provinces. So we looked at access to the same primary care physician over time. Um, first, mental health or addiction treatment contact being in an emergency department. Physician follow-up after a hospital discharge for a mental health-related visit. Um, rates of suicide attempts, rates of suicide, and standardized mortality rates. So um, all of the measures were for people that were diagnosed with a mental disorder or substance use, and, and uh, we used ICD-10 codes to ascertain those, those diagnoses. And data for the six indicators came from very comparable data sets across the, the six provinces, some of which Wayne already mentioned, so physician billing and patient hospitalizations, EDs, and, and death registers. Um, it's probably important to note that the, the definition of the indicators was set um, sometimes very narrowly for the purposes of comparability. So there were some indicators where certain provinces actually had data and, and the capacity to broaden the definition or to include additional data. So, for example, Alberta. I think Wayne has relatively robust uh, community data that they could have included, but because other provinces don't have that ability, um, we had to exclude that from the definition. So that's what I mean by narrowing the definition for the purposes of comparison. So we established the indicator uh, working group, as I mentioned before, held regular meetings and really just described the indicators in detail, um, the steps used to uh, abstract the data, for both the numerator and the denominator of the indicator, and then also included information about the format of the tabulation to make Wayne's job a lot easier in the end when we got all the results from the provinces to, to collate them. So just to give you a bit of an example of some of the decisions that need to be made when you're looking at indicators and some of these comparability issues, I'm just going to use first contact with the system for mental health, mental disorder or addiction in an emergency department. We use that indicator as an example. So you can see um, the numerator and the denominator. So that was initially what the team had decided to use. And so it looks relatively straightforward, but some of the definitions or some of the decisions that need to be made include things like how long do you set your look back period for? Because you need to make sure that all five provinces are doing it the same way. Um, how do you define any provider? So does any provider include just a general practitioner? Or does it include a psychiatrist, psychologist? So those things need to be identical. Um, how exactly are we going to define MHA? So which codes from the ICD are we going to use? Are we going to include dementia in our definition? Um, in terms of the hospitalization, did the mental um, health related visit, did that need to be the most responsible diagnosis? So this is just a snapshot just 
to give you an idea of some of the things that we needed to decide as a team. Again, there's no match to it, but we would decide um, by a consensus and record our justifications for these decisions as we went along. So in terms of access requests, I've just listed here the agencies that were used across the, the five provinces. Um, and this really was, uh, for me in particular, a, a really enlightening kind of experience to see um, how different it, it is for each team going about um, applying for these data. Um, to give you a bit of an idea in terms of um, cost, uh, the cost to access these data for the, the six indicators range from about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. That's not to say that it it may it, it could have been more. We actually had a fifteen thousand dollar per province cap on um, our budget, so that was as high as we could go. Um, but that's around the cost. Our experience was that in British Columbia, in Manitoba, in Ontario, um, the process was relatively straightforward. And what I mean by that. Our centers like Population Data BC, Manitoba Center for Health Policy, and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences have um, a pretty long history of uh, receiving, uh, approving, and providing administrative data. And they obviously have relationships and, and contracts and the authority from the provincial government to provide these data for uh, research purposes. So while there were some differences in the process, there at least was a standardized process. So when you apply to POP data, you fill out a data access request or a DAR, and you go through a very sort of structured series of, of events. Um, and then, of course, the time that it takes depends very, very much on the complexity of your data request and the cost and all of those types of things. We had a bit of a different experience in Alberta where we were working directly with the provincial government. So um, I guess one benefit of that is that Alberta ended up being sort of the most efficient because we were working directly with the data holders. So once we had approval, it was very fast. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, the cost was negotiated based on our project. I think the, the pitfall to um, something like that is that without a standardized process, there's not really necessarily, um, you know, a guarantee that the, the project will, will move forward and you're sort of working at, at the whim of what is um, in the priority area of the provincial government at, at that time. And similarly in Quebec, the INSPQ, um, while they have a, a relationship with the provincial government and, and they're used to working closely with them for their own data and surveillance purposes, they too do not have a standardized process for data access requests. So the, the, the work um, in those areas was a little bit more um, burdensome, but also a little more unique to our project. So for the analysis, um, as I said, each team needed to obtain their own data summaries and then send them to Wayne. Um, the time ranged from about four months in Alberta to approximately nine months in British Columbia. So just to be clear, that, that time frame is from when the data was approved, like the, the request was approved to when we actually got data. So um, pretty quick in Alberta and a, a um, fairly lengthy amount of time in British Columbia and the other provinces fell sort of somewhere in between. If any issues arose during the abstraction process, um, we needed to sort of systematically communicate that to other provinces to make sure that there was consistency. So while we spent a lot of time on the indicator specifications up front, there are some things that you can't necessarily predict that will come up. So for example, when Alberta was doing their abstraction, they came across a case where I think when there was a physician billing within a hospitalization and they, you know, said, you know, what, what do we do with this? And so we had to make a decision, but then communicate that to everybody else. And then um, Wayne here at Karma performed the final aggregation for the provincial comparisons. And finally, this was a very sort of brief stage of our project because we were running out of time, but we did spend some time on the interpretation of the results. We met on several occasions to look at the provincial trends and discuss them and try to figure out why there might be some outliers. Um, and each provincial representative was responsible for any further provincial work within their own results. 
Um, one of the things that you know we we mentioned in our study is that in future the interpretation for the interpretation stage you really do need to engage people at the policy level and and preferably at the service level as well who might have some ideas about the context and the nuances within their particular province that might help to explain some of those differences. So I'm going to pass it over to Wayne to just briefly um, describe some of the results from the project. Okay, thank you. Just uh, basically, uh, I think within this presentation, but certainly on Carla's website, we have a full technical document that describes all of the results in detail, and we have a, a, um, a more readable document that's um, just describes selected results along the way too. So I would encourage you, anyone who's interested um, in the details of this to actually check those out because um, you're just going to get a very, very brief touch on what's gone on, gone on here along the line. Um, for each one of the indicators, what we tried to do is we tried to look at three-year trends within our province, uh, broken down by agent sex as was possible, and then kind of rolling them up and looking at what the provincial differences might be in your uh, Provincial differences would be on sort of on an aggregate level, on an average level. Um, we weren't really interested in, um, you know, three-year trends across the country differentiating by province. Um, the data is just not that robust at this point in time. Um, and the point here again really was, was this was attempting to be a debt administration project that interesting information could come out about some kind of reasonably accepted indicators or well-known indicators or potential indicators of performance in the mental health area across the country that would tell people something. And that was really what the goal of this whole project was all about. That's what the funders were interested in. And it was basically sort of a group of provinces trying to say, or researchers of provinces saying, hey, this could be done at a national level if we really wanted to. So I'm just going to present some um, brief stuff for a couple of measures here. Um, one measure that we had here was the rate of suicide attempts for people with mental health and addictions. Um, the description there is just a number of people who receive services for a mental disorder in a year that makes you um, a mental health and addiction uh, individual, I guess, or client, if you want to say of those, how many attempted but did not die due to suicide? Um, and the rationale for this is that basically suicide attempts are an important indicator of potentially completing suicide. So if you want to intervene and reduce your suicide rate, in some ways you've got a, um, a built-in target population right there with um, the both people who attempted suicide. Um, and you know, and, you know, youth suicide, suicides in younger ages are a high level of, or ranked very highly up in the cause of death in their age group. So it's it is a very important um, factor in the youth side of things. Um, so just to go on here, this particular indicator um, and what we're trying to do here, our initial interest in the thing was that we wanted to compare the rates of um, attempted suicide for those people who had a mental health and addiction issue with the rates of attempted suicide for people who didn't have a mental health and addiction issue. Uh, I'm not going to present that, those particular results here because basically we found that those people who didn't have a mental health and addiction issue rarely would show up in our data sets as having attempted suicide. I'll we'll have a little bit more to say about that later. I also want to point out that this rate of suicide attempts for people with um, mental health addictions, the rate of suicide attempts measure across the country is one of the six mental health and addiction indicators endorsed by the different provinces and um, during the health, the mental health accords that have just been taking place in the last couple of years. And actually, the Kai Hai will be at, um, reporting on this in uh, a a consistent fashion. They have been reporting on it to some degree now. Um, it's not not just for people that have a home but they will be moving on to the uh, 
<coughs> um, this particular uh, measure being expanded and will become a regular uh, performance measure across the country being reported by Paraha. So, a couple of graphs here. Um, we have rates um, on the suicide attempts per 100 uh, in males and on the other side of the, on the right -hand side of the graph is the same graph, uh, same measure for females. Um, this data here is for just people who qualify as having a mental health and addiction group uh, condition. Um, if I were to have plotted out or presented the uh, the non-mental health and addiction rates, they'd be all focused, they'd just be all across all ages, bouncing around zero, looking kind of like what the bottom line on the uh, um, male side does uh, at the older age groups, all the way across ages. So we're just dealing with the mental health and addiction group. Another thing I want to point out is although I, I we have all five provinces listed here. Uh, we did this deliberately. We don't have data for one of the provinces in this particular list here. That being, that being, uh, yes. So uh, those are male and female, and then we also have uh, a pattern established for you know males and females combined. Um, and again, this is collapsed. We did this for three different um, Years. This is an average of across the three years, so we can compare the provinces. What does it show? Well, it shows that BC and Alberta are pretty close together. Um, it shows that the rates of suicide attempts are in Manitoba um, and are actually lower in okay. Ontario. So that. Um, You know, each province, and certainly I think this was a bit of a surprise to Manitoba, although you kind of know that your uh, suicide rates are higher. Um, they have a little bit of knowledge that their suicide attempts might be higher, given what kind of produces, but it's just hospital data the one player. But it's clearly spread across the age groups, so it's not just a unique thing to some particular age group from uh, Manitoba's point of view. Uh, and it's also sort of a little bit higher in the elderly. And they also, you know, so clearly they want to, uh, the Manitoba people want to present this data, push this data forward to the Manitoba government. From the Ontario side of things, it doesn't look like they have the ability to basically say this is not something that we particularly need to um, be focused in on. So, uh, one of the things we did do about this indicator course is this is just hospital accounts. What we were able to look at is getting some community data from, um, in terms of ED visits. So people who show up to a hospital <coughs> with an ED um, diagnosis, I said it was an attempted suicide. We can do that analysis in Alberta and Ontario. What we found is, although uh, it raised the rates up for both um, the mental health uh, individuals and the non-mental health individuals, um, it actually raised the non-mental health individual rates up higher, um, not higher than the mental health cases, but just up well, almost zero, and essentially increased by a factor of 10. So again, that's a, an important point to keep in mind is that the type of data you can call that um, will really influence these types of indicators. And across the country, they're limited to the least available. Um, but in other cases, if you have additional data, you might be a slightly different picture. So the second thing we'd just like to briefly touch on here <coughs> is mortality uh, among people with mental health disorder. Um, it's been long known, long, long time known for a long time that people with mental health and addiction issues um, have a higher mortality rate. Uh, it's something that's not routinely collected or reported on, um, but it's not a unique and surprising finding either. 
So what we want, again, we just want to look at here is we're interested in the standardized mortality ratio in this particular case. And what that measure is, is that if you had a, the measure that we used here basically was we identified a case of um, a mental health and addiction case based on a previous year, two years worth of administrative data, and then look to see uh, how many of those people died in the subsequent year compared to the expected death rate given the um, potential slide. There goes the heater again. So, uh, so we know the rates are going to be higher. Why do we want to use standardized mortality ratios as opposed to just death ratios? It's because you know young people don't die at a very high rate to begin with. And what happens is that the younger age groups differences tend to get um, washed out because of such a small rate, and you know people just die as they get older at a higher rate, and so you, some of the differences tend to disappear. Um, so that was why we're focusing in on this particular one. Uh, we looked at two different measures uh, on your uh, left side of the screen here. You'll see this is standardized mortality for all mental health and addiction cases. Um, this is anyone who uh, had met the criteria in the previous two years. How did, what was their death rates compared to the expected death rates? So see we had data available for three provinces. Um, I don't want to pick in Quebec, this just sort of happened. Quebec did report in some stuff. Um, this happens at the two that we were showing here. Um, they didn't report on the, didn't, they didn't like the standardized mortality rates. They wanted to be yeah, just, the, just the death rates, and they found that their mental health and addiction death rates were higher than uh, non-mental health and addiction death rates, but um, they, didn't, they didn't like the standardized mortality measure uh, just on principle. And some of the data from Ontario um, was quite, quite different. It's, it's so different that it was almost like there's something else going on within their data sets. And at that point in time, they just hadn't sorted out enough that they felt comfortable producing or having their data as part of this particular group here. So they're looking into why their numbers are so different from the rest of us. There's three provinces there. Um, you can see that each province is kind of more or less the same in terms of the shape. You know, there's a lot of variability here to a large degree, but uh, you know, it's a factor of about two. It's twice, you know, it's higher by a factor of two across most of the age get up until very, very elderly along the way. On the uh, right side of your screen is a slightly different measure. Um, here we just looked at those people who were hospitalized in the previous two years for a mental health and addiction measure. That is, of course, much fewer in terms of number than um, what the graph on the left is based on, but it's also clearly a much more severe case. Um, if you get hospitalized for a mental health and addiction issue, um, you're usually seen as a pretty severe case. You can see that the scales are like uh, differ by factor 10 almost, um, going from 0 to 20 for the more severe cases. And you can see that the death rates here are much higher. Um, the Manitoba rates being a little bit lower, um, but the BC and Alberta rates are, especially the kind of young adult type level, are quite hot uh, in terms of uh, compared to the, the average of the population. So um, basically, if you're young and you have a mental health and addiction problem, there's a high risk that you're going to end up you know, dying, a much higher risk than if you don't have a mental health and addiction problem. Um, and I know some you know, the kind of common measure as well is just suicide, you know, they have a risk of suicide, but it's not the case if you actually look at the death rates for these people or what causes of death. It is suicide, it's other causes of death, but it's also accidental rates, which may or may not be suicide. So again, this tells you that severe cases have a bigger issue. It's at least common across two, if not three provinces across the country. Um, the next data essentially shows this in a different format too. That's something that I think people should be paying attention to. 
So, anyway, that's basically just an example of it. There's much more detail in the technical reports in our final report. And I encourage you, anyone who's interested, to look at it. If you have any questions, you can find that. Back to Amanda. All right, the, and a link for the plain language report is um, will be included in the presentation, and the technical report is also on the CRM website. So that was just a really brief snapshot, snapshot of two of the indicators, but um, kind of going back to the key learnings and, and recommendations for moving forward, um, unsurprisingly, our experience was that um, developing comparable indicators across provinces was extremely challenging. Um, a lot of that has to do with the differences in administrative access procedures, data sources, and availability for, for this type of research to exist. Um, interpretation of the data, as I said, requires further research. And so our project doesn't really answer the why questions. I mean, we can speculate why, for example, Manitoba has a higher um, rate of, of suicide attempts and suicides. But um, to, to thoroughly answer those questions, a number of other people would have need to be engaged in this process. And so that's something that really needs to happen, I think, at the provincial level. We saw that coverage of data sources is limited in some provinces, um, as is emergency department data, although that's starting to improve. And quite frankly, community mental health data across the country is very poor. And data standardization um, would certainly help to facilitate some of these interprovincial comparisons and, and start to move this forward. So here's a couple of links, one to the, um, the paper that we just recently had published in the International Journal of Population Data Science, which focuses almost exclusively on the process for this project and some of the key learnings. It doesn't, um, doesn't talk about the results at all. But if you want to look at the results, the Karma um, website includes the plain language report that's on the right-hand side, as well as a 150-some-odd page technical report if you're interested in the data specifications. And you can also contact Wayne if you have additional questions about that. So I'm going to just very, very briefly touch on um, some promising progress in this area. I had the luxury of hearing about this project um, when I was at the IPDLN conference in September and Dr. Kim McGrail from Population uh, Data BC was presenting on the uh, Pan-Canadian Real World Health Data Network, which is something that is currently in the works. And I'm not actually a part of this project, so I've borrowed a couple of Kim's uh, slides, but if you want more information about this, you can um, look at it online and also join the consortium. But my understanding is the PRHDN, um, it includes senior representatives from organizations across Canada. Um, I believe that they have all 10 provinces and one territory so far on board. And the goal really is to tackle a lot of the issues that Wayne and I have raised in the presentation so far. Um, with the goal to really revolutionize this sector and, and enable researchers and educators to um, conduct multi-province research more efficiently in Canada. Um, what we saw through this feasibility project and what other researchers have identified is the problems in Canada are not related to a lack of, of technical capacity or skill. It's really a lack of dedicated resources and a lack of governance coordination that has us in the situation that we're in now where this work is so challenging. And so the goal of, of, of this network really is to establish some clear methods for working together more effectively and some processes for decision making and strong governance in this area so that projects like the one that we just presented on would be made a lot easier and could be um, sustainable over time. So here's just a few points about kind of the vision of this distributed network and some of the broader sort of objectives of the PRHDN. Um, I think, you know, this is the this is the first that I've heard of a project that I think really will show promise for capitalizing on on what really is world class potential for, for Canada um, to, to be at the forefront, given some of the amazing data that exists in this country and, and really incredible technical capacity that's uh, that exists across the provinces. And so, you know, as Wayne was saying, with his, his role on, on the, the FAC and Kai High committees, I think. Um, you know, Wayne was one of the founding participants on some of these committees and, and year after year they're having a lot of the same conversations and, and addressing the same questions and I think that there's, there has been kind of a lack of overall um, movement in this area and so 
uh, definitely keep on the pulse of the PRHDN. Like I said, you can look it up online, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Kim McGrail would welcome any questions should you have any. She's um, at UBC and is the principal applicant on, on this project. So that's, um, that's it. I think you know we're happy to, to take any questions with the final 15 minutes that we have here. Anne, if you want to help moderate that. Great. Thank you very much, Amanda and Wayne, for your excellent presentation. Um, excellent work to be working uh, with so many provinces across Canada. And as you mentioned, lots of potential for new opportunities that are coming along as well. So, so lots to look forward to. Um, I do have some questions. Okay, so that was the question about the, uh, the graphs that you provided? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so primarily in R. And then the next question, uh, can you see that one there? Wondering if there are plans to validate the identification of mental health and substance use diagnoses through chart abstraction or other means, having worked on a related project in Ontario. My understanding is that it's very difficult to accurately identify mental health diagnoses through admin data. Um, well, the answer is no, we're not going to verify the diagnoses through um, and, uh, in the way that's outlined there. It's been an ongoing issue um, for 15 years about using admin data for mental health diagnoses. Well, we are, um, and there have been a couple of validation actually exercises attempted primarily through Ontario work. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's often, because of course, it's very difficult to compare it to what? Um, if you compare it to electronic medical health um, records within a particular clinic, that really depends on that clinic having the full um, treatment of all, of all the treatment the patient goes through. And oftentimes we found that there's some um, diagnoses from other providers that the clinic's particularly not aware of that can result in a person being a mental health case. Well, we are doing actually in a different project that I'm involved with, with Karma right now, is that we are looking at comparing what we, how we can define mental health and addiction data using admin data, um, what kind of rules or algorithms we will work with, like one diagnosis of MSP or two diagnoses of MSP within a year, and comparing that to um, a, a set of epidemiological um, rates that we've identified through the literature. So we are trying to verify that, and hopefully we'll have that done in a slightly different manner, and hopefully we'll have that done in, a, uh, in another year. And ideally, then we'll have some sense of what, how the immune data differs from what the epidemiological data looks like. But in response to that question, identifying anybody who's had a mental illness or substance use disorder in the administrative data generally is not difficult. What would be difficult would be, say, comparing BC's rates of a specific disorder to Ontario's, because then there needs to be validation around the coding. So to be clear, is not a difficult exercise, and there, and there have been validation, certainly, of those, of those codes that if somebody had a mental health or, or, or addiction um, related visit in a hospital that that we feel comfortable that we can trust that that person um, was at least accurately diagnosed according to to the to those terms, but we wouldn't necessarily be comparing across provinces in terms of specific disorders unless we knew that that we could safely do that. We have another question here that says, could we possibly reapply the methodology in another country? How Canada specific is the methodology? Um, I think, and Wayne, you might chime in on this, um, certainly the process could be applied to uh, really any country, as could the indicator definitions themselves. What would be country-specific would be the, the data holdings and the data sources. That, depending on what you have available in another country, you might not be able to, to populate those specific indicators. So the framework itself, I think, um, could certainly be applied, and, and the the article that we wrote um, for the journal was really sort of intentionally framed around being applicable uh, outside of Canada, but certainly the data sources would be country specific. Yeah, and, you know, in many respects, 
the re, you know, Canada's as an advanced country, uh, our advance in uh, health data is nowhere near equal to a lot of other countries. And there's probably a lot of countries that would look at our paper and look at what we did and just kind of chuckle and think, man, I'm glad I don't live in Canada and work in this area. Um, but, but any particular distributed data set in, in any particular area, be a country or different countries, for example, um, Yes, this kind of thing I think could work. Mm -hmm. The basic focus was getting your group together, determining how you could all have measured something in the same way, deciding on uh, measures that would be of interest or uh, you know, results that would be of interest across the whole pot, uh, all the participants, and then basically each participant putting the time and effort into doing the work and having one person or one group willing to compile them all. That methodology uh, would certainly be applicable everywhere, and I, I don't, we we're not hardly breaking new ground in that methodology. Either. The very first question um, that was asked about um, coding, and I had mentioned IC. 10 code that you had referenced earlier. Um, when you answered that question, I only heard part of your answer. Sure, sounds good. So, yep, yeah, uh, just verifying that we did use ICD-10 um, F codes for the hospital for the hospital data. Yeah, it's ICD-9 coding for the billing data, and that, um, strangely enough, is consistent across the country. Um, <clears throat> no one has moved yet, as far as I know, to ICD-10 for billing purposes. So you have to be able to work with both um, ICD-9 and ICD-10. But uh, hopefully someday everyone will get on ICD-10 before ICD-20 comes up. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for that. So I don't see any further questions. Um, thank you again for your excellent presentation. And as uh, everyone can see, there are emails for follow-up. If there's anything else, uh, Amanda or Wayne, that you'd like to share, please let me know, and I can always um, post it to our site along with your recording as well. Excellent. Thanks very much, Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye for now.